It's great to have uh, today uh, Nick, uh, Nicholas Wilkins from uh, Bristol and he's going to talk to us about uh, constructions of equivariant quantum operations and the relations between them. So go ahead Nick. Uh, marvellous, uh, thank you and uh, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, I guess this is probably the, the biggest seminar I've actually talked at somehow. Um, what I want to talk about is a um, it's a collection, I guess, of pieces, um, various different pieces that um, I've done in PhD and then since then, and some is joint work with Paul Seidel, um, which kind of at the time seemed quite disconnected, but I want to try to fit them into one, one framework altogether of kind of these equivariant quantum uh, operations. Um, I hope I don't go too fast. Every time I've practiced it, it's been 50 minutes rather than an hour. So I'll try to slow down for this. Um, right, so um, just a couple of assumptions to start with. Um, so just for this, we're going to talk about closed monotone symplectic manifolds, um, fixed and always complex structure J. We're going to work um, over F2 coefficients, but that's mainly to, to make everything much simpler um, and there are analogs of basically everything for larger primes um, and also uh, when I talk about uh, singular when I talk about cohomology I'm really talking about Morse cohomology so there's always going to be some Morse function flying around um, somewhere. Um, classically the uh, there's this Steenrod square due to Steenrod, which um, acts on the on the cohomology of let's say topological space um, to be general, and it takes the cohomology of this topological space to the Z mod two equivariant cohomology um, with the trivial Z mod two action. Which, forgetting about what that really means, we can think about that as being polynomials um, in Sorry. Um, um, polynomials in uh, some variable h um, with coefficients in the cohomology and um, this h really comes from the cohomology of the classifying space of z mod 2 which is rp infinity and if you recall that's just uh, a copy of z mod 2 in each degree so um, the, the really this comes from the fact that you know, you've got this this cut product structure on the homology but when you think about it on the chain level it's it's not necessarily commutative on the nose it's commutative up to homotopy and it's commutative up to all higher homotopies and kind of the i homotopies one can think of as being kind of the h to the i term of this steamrod operation um, so there's a couple of um, kind of ways of thinking about this in terms of Morse theory done independently. Um, I'll mention Betts and Cohen a bit later, but um, Fukaya spoke about um, in, in a paper about uh, a way of defining versions of these Steenrod squares now for quantum cohomology. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to actually rigorously define anything in this talk but um, I will kind of give an indication of what they are by analogy with the cut product. But they're gonna be exactly the same. They're gonna take the quantum cohomology of this symplectic manifold and they're gonna land in these um, uh, polynomials over H. So, okay, analogy between the two. Um, so in the cut product, you have for any good product, two inputs, one output. In the steamrod square, you have now one input, um, but then you've got a whole kind of set of outputs for um, each non-negative integer, corresponding to the h to the i term of this um, uh, cohomology of bz mod 2. Um, and you can think about this as being to do with the fact that really your 
thinking about a Z mod two symmetry in the cut product. You know, it's based upon the map x goes to x times x, and so it's you know one input. And so q being the quantum term, if you look at the coefficient of y q to the j, say in x plus times x minus, and again this is Morse cohomology, so these are all critical points of f. Um, then the corresponding thing in the quantum steam rod uh, square is um, now you've got this h to the i factor corresponding to the cohomology of bz mod 2. Now on the left hand side you're going to count j holomorphic maps plus some other stuff. On the right hand side your moduli space is going to um, consist of pairs where your um, the first of the pair, the v, is in an equivalent parameter space. And um, in fact, if you look at the h to the i term, you're kind of chopping down your parameter space to the i sphere, and u is a holomorphic sphere. And then, um, you know, what are the conditions on u? Well, um, in the cut product setting, you've got incidences with, let's say, uh, infinity plus or minus one, because that's what I'll be using throughout this, um, with kind of perturbed Morse half flow lines. The corresponding thing on the quantum steam rod side is now these Morse flow lines, at least the, the positive Morse flow lines, are going to have some V dependence. Um, and they're asymptoting to now X and X on the positive side. And then the perturbations that we're going to have to pick, um, so you, know, you pick three perturbations for the quantum cut product and for the quantum steam rod square, now you only have two choices, um, which again comes from the fact that the two inputs, let's say, um, on the positive side are going to have to be related by symmetry. So I'll, the picture's on the next slide, so that'll be slightly more illuminating, I think, then. Okay. Um, and the thing I want to uh, draw your attention to, there's two things here um, on this. I mean, this, this is not a particularly well-drawn picture. I've got, unfortunately, limited resources um, here. But um, the main difference is that if you're looking at the quantum CMOD square, which is on the bottom, then on the positive um, half lines, you've now got on one of them F1 at V and S, and on the other one, you've got F1 at the, the action of Z mod 2 on the infinite di dimensional sphere, which is the antiquitor map. And you can see that with this choice, we've got a uh, uh, Z mod 2 action on the moduli space of pairs V and U, which is if you take V and U, um, then minus V and U composed with the unique reparameterization of the sphere that takes one to minus one and fits its infinity. So if S2 is C union infinity, this is just the minus one map. Um, and so if you're going to count this moduli space in zero dimensions, normally characteristic two, you'd always get a count of zero. So you question out by this. And that's that's as much, I think, as I want to say about the definition of, in air quotes, um, definition of the quantum c mod square. Um, but so this is this is one example of, I guess, a more general notion of uh, equivariant quantum operations. So here we, you know, we've got three mark points. Um, we've got the group we're using is Z-mod2, the simplest non-trivial group. And um, there's a kind of only one possible domain we could use, which is you know, the, the sphere. But um, we may want to vary the number of our mark points. We may want to change what our finite group is. And once we've added more mark points, we might want to vary the domain of our holomorphic maps. Um, so supposing that we say, you know, delete month space with one plus n mark points is the space of genus zero stable node or homomorphic curves. You're going to have one plus n mark points. You've got an uh, output z0 and then kind of n inputs z1 up to zn up to biholomorphism. And then supposing that you pick a subgroup of the symmetric group on n, um, on n points. And um, you uh, pick some, let's say a prime that is uh, divides the size of G. 
um, there's a kind of a natural action of G on this uh, the Mumford space on the inputs by permuting them, you know, where you fix the, the output mark point. And the idea, and again, no, I mean, this isn't a thing that I can say is defined in, you know, I've got a definition in general, but the idea should be that if we have a element of the G equivariant homology of this Lee Mumford space, we should be able to define a G equivariant quantum cohomology operation over F P. And um, as before, we're going to assume P equals two um, for easiness. Um, I don't know why. I guess it's good to have a slide in. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is just need just to get in people's minds if they're not quite seeing. Um, in if we're looking at say Lee Mumford space with one plus three mark points, what the action does. So you can think about what two three does on this point, and you can see it maps it to a distinct point in the space. And what one two does is it maps it to the same point because we only care about things up to reparameterizations. Right. So, okay, well, I've, I've kind of given you an idea of what sort of, you know, what, the, what we'd wish, but what are some examples of such a thing? So supposing we've got um, the Lee Mumford space with uh, one plus N mark points. And supposing we, we pick a closed submanifold to something that, that um, represents a homology class, and suppose it's fixed as a set by G. Um, now, if you think about, um, about the homology of the classifying space of G, so H star of BG, you can think about, okay, take, a, uh, take some element of this, and you take a representative, and then you lift it, to the contractible um, contractible space with the free G action EG. And supposing that you can do this in such a way that you get you know, a, a manifold with boundary, make things nice and easy. Um, then if you look at the um, product of uh, this closed sum manifold with this lift, then this should represent some elements of the G equivalent homology of Lee Mumford space. So this, this gives us examples of, you know, of such things that we might want to consider. Um, so an example which is going to come up near the end, uh, if we pick n to be four out input mark points, and now we pick uh, a group to be um, d8 in the symmetric group of four um, points, uh, generated by the transmissions one, two, and one, three, two, four, then we want to think about what are some fixed sets under this action. Well, think about M1, which is where one and two come together and three and four come together. And you see that this is definitely fixed under one, two. It's definitely fixed under one, three, two, four. So this by itself is a fixed set. Um, but you, I mean, now you can think about what does, what happens with um, one, three acting on M1. So this is when one, four come together and two and three come together. And you see that this is not fixed under D8 because um, if you act on it by one and two, then you get the thing where two and four come together and one and three come together. Um, but the pair consisting of one, three M1 and one, four M1 is a fixed set. Um, and I guess you could think of them as representatives of the cosets of D8 in, um, in the symmetric group of order four. So again, these are, these are going to come up later, but I'll mention them again when they do. So, um, okay. Um, so again, uh, this is just the idea rather than a, a, Firm definition, but you know, given some um, some element of the G equivariant homology, we want to define an operation that I'm going to call Q sub G, and um, it's going to take a certain number of inputs, um, and these inputs are actually going to correspond to the number of orbits of G on the set one up to n. 
um, this the, the reason why maybe you, you want to do this should become a bit clearer as we see more examples but um, you could pick you could pick just one input like we did for the quantum steamrod square but this is a slight more general situation um, and yeah this is so yeah, it's going to want to have that and then it's going to want to have an output in the quantum curl origin um, you know and, and say the intuition is similar to quantum steamrod squares um, except you know, given some element of the g equivalent homology what do we want to do well, we want to pick some smooth submanifold representative and what this is going to do is this is going to encode pairs so you've got a pair which is a domain for the homomorphic maps and an equivalent parameter value v in eg and if you think back to the quantum steamrod square this is kind of the same situation except we had now um, to leave off a space with one plus two mark points which is just a point itself so we had no way of choosing our domain and so you know th th that's why we didn't include an m earlier but yeah so that's what we want to do is we want to kind of um think about it like that um uh, and again, recall that um, for the quantum steamrod square, we had um, you know just one choice of um, perturba perturbation of our Morse function f, um, and kind of the reason for that was because we had one there's one orbit of the um, transposition one two on the set of points one two, but more generally we're going to want a Morse function perturbation for each g orbit, um, along with some symmetry conditions, which I'll get onto in a moment. Um, but they're kind of going to have to arise from the stabilizer of g acting on each of the orbits. So, um, supposing that you've got some some um, numbers j and k between one and n and supposing they're in the same orbit, then just pick some, some uh, G, J, K, which is an element of our boot G, um, that takes J to K. Now, um, I'm gonna try to explain this diagram. It's not, not the most well-drawn one I've ever done. Um, but the symmetry condition should basically be made so that it doesn't matter what, in what way we've chosen these G, J, K. Um, and the idea that maybe you can do this in general, I, I mean, hopefully so, but definitely in all the situations where I've actually constructed these things, it's actually been fine to, to allow such symmetries. Um, so, yeah, this is a terrible diagram, I'm afraid. Um, okay, so think about it that your indices are you know, split into orbits, and let's say, one is contained in the orbit a1 and um, then to each of the um, points in the orbit each of the indices in the orbit a1 you attach a flow line and along that flow line you're going to use the perturbed morse function f sup, sup a1 with some choice of equivalent parameter and you know s is the value that you uh, you vary along the half line and then say if you've got some other j within this orbit, well, what are you going to use for your equivalent parameter is going to be g one j. And don't forget that this is an element of g, which we know acts on e g. So this is a reasonable thing to do. Um, and yeah, as I say, you're going to want to choose things so that um, so that you it, you know it doesn't matter what you choose, it doesn't matter in which order you do. Um, okay, yes, and again, this is so this is a coefficient of y. I'm forgetting about the quantum variable to save on space. Um, in Q of W acting on now x1 up to xa, and you see that x1 is the asymptotic for a1 and xa for these um, these orbits aa. Did I, did I describe these aas before? I think I might have skipped that. Um, these aas are the g orbits of of one up to n um, and again you know this this pair consisting of a, 
um, n plus one mark points and some parameter is some representative of W. So assuming you trust me that there's some sort of definition hidden in there. Um, okay, here's maybe a slightly firmer example. So again, as I say, the Lee mark for space with one plus two mark points is itself a point. And we can assume that the point is infinity plus one and minus one up to PSL2C. And so it's clearly a fixed set. And as I said before, you know, these, the, a fixed set gives you equivariant operations. There's a fixed set under this action one, two. Um, and it determines an equivariant operation for each element, as I say, of uh, the homology of BZ mod two, which we remember is just Z mod two each degree. And it's um, represented by, let's say, the upper I-dimensional hemisphere. Then this operation that you get is exactly the h to the i term of the quantum c mod square. So this is just just this, the other way of looking at it, rather than the the way in which you have um, everything written out, I guess, slightly more explicitly. Okay. Now to the bit that I think is slightly more interesting. Um, so what are the different ways in which you can relate these operations? You know, I mean, you've, you've got, um, you, you have varying groups, you have varying domains, you have varying numbers of mark points. And all of these um, kind of give you an avenue to, to relate the different sorts. So the way in which you, especially for the monotone case, let's say, would construct you would be able to construct these is as a pseudocycle, for example, some sort of intersection of pseudocycles. Um, and this gives you some sort of coefficient of a, of a, uh, an output, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the, the upshot being that this is a, this is a homological definition. So two different representatives of the same homology class in this G equivariant homology should give you the same operation Q sub G. But these two representatives might look quite different. In fact, that's the, that's the um, uh, example that I'm, I'm going to talk about in a bit. And, um, and that will give you a relationship between two different operations. Um, the second one is, as say, varying groups. Um, so, you know, if you've got one a subgroup of, of another group, then there's kind of an induced map. And by looking at the properties of that map, you can potentially get some, some uh, ground there. And the final thing that I'm not going to talk about too much, but um, supposing you've got n marked points and you fill in m of them, then you've got an n minus m mark point equivariant um, operation, assuming that you do things in kind of a, a g equivariant way. Um, and that should be able to relate two things. In fact, it, it's kind of part of, of the proof of the theorem that I think is on the next slide, um, but I won't discuss that too much. Um, so, for the first of these, okay. So this is this is um, the joint work with Paul Seidel. Um, okay, so going back again, we've got this Deleen Mumford space with one plus two mark points, represented again by this particular point. Um, but now suppose we add another mark point, Z3. So now we're in the Lee Mumford space with one plus three mark points. Um, and we ask that G be the same. So G is still the transmission one, two, and fixes three. And you see that now there's two G orbits on one, two, and three. Um, and so in the, um, uh, from what I said earlier, that means because there's two orbits, there should be two distinct inputs which we're going to call alpha and x to stick with the notation from other places. Um, and alpha is going to kind of go in at the points one and two, and x is going to go in at point at the z2. Um, now, within this, this two-dimensional um, space of operations, uh, so within this two-dimensional Lee Mumford space of one plus three mark points, uh, there is a particular mark, a particular choice of position for Z3, and that's at Z3 equals zero. 
And that's interesting because if you put Z3 at zero, then you think about what happens when you swap one and two, well, there is a biholomorphism that takes it back to the same point. So this point Z3 equals zero is a fixed point of this particular G action. Um, and therefore it defines an operation in the, the way that I um, talked about before, which is um, due to Seidel. And it takes um, two elements of quantum cohomology and it outputs, say, a polynomial of um, elements of quantum cohomology, uh, where, yeah, in the, where the kind of the H to the I term as before corresponds to using the um, generator of the I homology of BZ12. Um, and you can maybe, maybe it would be easier to see on the next slide when I've got a picture up, but um, you can see that if you take this second point here, this X, and you put in one, you retrieve back the quantum steroid square. So really this, this contains the same operate, the same information as the steroid square, but it's a more natural um, thing to look at. And um, so, there is a, a theorem um, that states that if um, you take a representative of the Poincaré dual of the first Chern class of some elements of manifold, then the following um, uh, equation is satisfied. So here h squared is the generator of the second cohomology of Bz mod two. Q dil Q, well Q is the is the um, quantum variable, if you take Q to the I and act on it, you get I Q to the I, um, and then you've got this, this thing is satisfied. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna talk about what this means or anything like that. I'm just talk, gonna talk about how to, how to look at how to prove this. Um, and the idea is as follows. Oh, no, okay, I forgot I had this slide. Um, so this is, a, this is a picture for Q sigma alpha of X. There's one thing that I wanted to, to demonstrate. Yeah, so the two inputs alpha are at one and minus one, the input X is at zero. And then as I said, because there's two orbits, you have to pick two choices of F and um, I get, you know, they have to satisfy certain um, symmetry condition if you're if you've got a stabilizer. So um, here G, recall on the um, infinite dimensional sphere is the antipodal map, and you want the F satisfied symmetry condition under the antipodal map, and therefore you want this to be true. Um, F three of V is F three of minus V, and in fact we can just assume that it's independent of V. Um, and then similarly here for one and two, you want that to get from one to two, you have to act by the non-trivial element in G, which is the antipodal map. Um, sorry, where, where am I? So, sorry, X, um, X should be a critical point of F. Yeah, so there's a question from, from uh, Leonid um asking where lies x and yeah it's it's a uh, it, so because these um all the homology i'm talking about is is morse cohomology um x here is a is a critical point that we're talking about um yeah right um okay so i'm going to talk about the the proof of the theorem at least part of the proof of the theorem now um, the, the part to do with equivariant homology. Um, and so suppose that you look at one of the terms in the theorem, uh, omega quantum product with Q sigma alpha X. Now this Q sigma of alpha applied to X has three input mark points. And when you take the, um, uh, when you multiply with omega, you should, will then get a fourth. So really, if we want to be looking at this, we want to be looking at objects in one plus um, four mark points. 
Um, and so that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll add another mark point Z4 um, using the same G. So G swaps one and two and it fixes three and it fixes four. Um, and you know, when this point, when you add it to, when, when you're looking at Lima for space one plus four mark points, this looks like um, CP2 cross CP2, uh, CP1 cross CP1 blown up at three points. Um, and we're going to need the following um, the, the lemma that is on the next slide, which um, kind of, I guess looks fairly uh, uh, counterintuitive, um, but is quite a nice um, uh, uh, nice little lemma. So um, supposing that you've got a, a smooth connected manifold. Um, with some smooth Z12 action on it. And supposing within that you've got an n dimensional submanifold closed and an n minus one dimensional submanifold of that closed, let's say, um, fixed as sets by this Z12 action. Um, and supposing that you can kind of break W up into some open subset U, um, the image of U and IOTA, and they are both connected along um, a common boundary of the closure L to make W. So W splits as U, attach along L with L to U. Um, and supposing we denote for the upper or lower I dimensional hemispheres in, in the infinite, infinite dimensional sphere, DI plus or minus, um, which we recall represent generators of the I homology of BZ12, then, well, you know that W cross D I minus one plus is a homology class, as is L cross with G I plus, but they actually give you the same homology class in this Z mod two equivalent homology. And the proof is three lines there, um, with uh, the only bit of any interest being the second um, line where we use the fact that there's a Z mod two action on this, that we only care about things up to Z mod two. Um, okay, so we're going to kind of try to use that now. Um, oh, I think I must have copied and pasted this. Um, we already have a monotone symplectic manifold M, um, and we already know N equals four. Okay, so recalling that um, Lee Mumford space with one plus four mark points, we can again, as before, choose up to biholomorphism to fix the first three mark points, let's say, at infinity plus one and minus one, and we let Z4, Z3 and Z4 vary. And G is still, as before, acting via the transposition one, two. Then you can consider the following closed submanifold of this Lee Mumford space, where we fix Z3 at. Um, what was D boundary? In, the, in this proof, D is, D is a boundary, maybe? Yeah, sorry. Um, so this is a very, um, very sketchy, sketchy proof. It should be proof in air quotes, I guess. Um, it's, I'm talking about, let's say that, the, that we're talking about um, a tri we pick a triangulation of X and then W and L are both um, oh, so simple C's and yeah. yeah. Um, right. Yeah, so we pick a particular choice of, of a two-dimensional sub-manifold of this four-dimensional space, this four-dimensional Lehmann space. And what we'll do is we'll fix Z3 at naught, and we'll let Z4 vary wherever we want it to be. So, you know, if you forget about the Z4 bit, for the moment, this is exactly the setup that we used for this Q sigma. Um, and then we compactify it to make W, which you can see by, by projection to the Z4 coordinate, let's say, um, is just the same as looking at the extended complex plane. Um, and the Z mod two action, you can also see fixes W, because I mean, um, you know, it, it swaps one and two, let's say, 
And so to get it back to its canonical form, with z0 equals infinity, z1 equals 1, z2 equals 2, you have to multiply uh, everything by the map that is um, uh, by the by holomorphism, which is kind of minus 1 on c union infinity. Um, and so this is going to multiplication by minus 1 on z4. Um, and then you can apply the lemma to w. And there's a picture on the next slide, which is um, probably more illuminating, but think about the, um, the extended complex plane as being the union of the upper and lower complex planes, separated by the real line. Then we know that the real, oh, sorry, the, oh, this, is, this should be the um, extended real line. Um, we know the extended real line is fixed by the antipodal map, and we know that W is split into the upper and lower complex planes. And so within um, the Z mod 2 equivalent homology of um, de Lee Mumford space, we know that the W and the uh, extended real line must, must denote the same um, homology class shifted by a factor of one. But then you can do the same with the extended real line and the subset, which is the points in naught and infinity. And you see that R splits into a positive and a negative half line. And so you can run the exact same thing again. So you get that the, again, it should be extended real line with the I plus one um, upper hemisphere is equal to, or well, you've got the, the set of naught and then the set of infinity. Right? I added a minus here, even though we're talking about, um, even though we're talking about characteristic two, um, just to, um, just because. Um, okay, so you put those two together and you get that the W um, operation is equal to this infinity and this naught operation shifted by two. And well, Again, as I said on a while ago, the operations for the operations you get by considering different representatives of the same homology class should be the same. Therefore, the operations that you get by looking at W should be the same as the operations that you get by looking at infinity plus the operation from naught shifted by some appropriate um, appropriate factor. And so there's a picture, that's a bit, that's a slightly more useful picture. Um, and so you get the following equation. And then remember, you've got a choice of, of inputs. So for Z1, Z2, um, you input alpha, for Z3, you input X, and for Z4, you input omega. And then you can just you, then you can equate the uh, terms of this equation with the terms in the theorem. So um, so I probably should have added another um, uh, another a diagram for this. But um, think about this: the first term on the right hand side. So you've got uh, inputs at plus or minus one, an input at zero, an input at infinity. And then you, so there, um, Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. Z1, Z2, I'll transform around Z4. And then you've got a freely moving point Z, uh, Z4. And when this mark point moves to infinity, it bubbles off to give you a sphere. And then the thing on the left hand side looks just like the quantum, uh, the Q sigma of alpha and X. And then on the right hand side, you've got the product with the input at Z4, which we've chosen to be omega. And then similarly here, and then kind of the, the meat of this is then to show that the left-hand sides are the same, um, which comes back to the, what I was talking about, the uh, different numbers and mark points um, coming into play. But I'm not gonna, not gonna get into that now, um, not the divisor axiom. Mm -hmm. So that's as much as I wanted to say about um, about the first of the three um, points. 
So I'll talk about the second one now. Um, so I said about, you know, varying the representative of the homology class, but we can also talk about varying the group. And that's really what the, what the Adem relations come down to, even the classical case. So for the steamrod squares, the classical Adem relations are this, this formula right here, where, um, so I didn't actually define what uh, steamrod upper P of alpha is, but it's the coefficient of um, the variable to the, the, comp the equivalent variable H to the power of the index of alpha minus P. And so this is just, this is just one of the coefficients of H. And so by, and which you can see is an element of the, of the standard cohomology. And so you can kind of take the, take the um, composition of these and I, I, I wouldn't bother to remember exactly what's going on here, but um, remember that there's Q's and P's, there's this binomial coefficient, and there's some sum over, over an S variable, because it will, it will appear again in a moment. Um, so, right, the proof of the Eden relations that I um, use, I guess, is... Um, it seems to comprise of two parts. So the second part, it's a it's a combinatorial argument um, for for this particular case in in mod two, um, uh, mod two binomial uh, coefficients. More generally, I mean, I'm sure that the same thing holds for general p, but it was quite nasty to prove it for p equals two. So, um, I haven't done that yet. Um, but the first part is it's the fact that a particular diagram commutes, and um, so I'll get to the I'll get to the reason why the composition of steamrod squares is a D8 equivariant operation in a moment. But if you trust me for now that it is, then the bottom arrow is um, the composition of steamrod squares, and um, you know, the top arrow is some operation which um, doesn't particularly matter for these purposes. And the right hand arrow, um, it is the identity on cohomology and on the cohomology of um, classifying spaces, it comes from the map that takes the classifying space of D8 to the classifying space of S4 by kind of further quotient um, And because the index of D8 in S4 is co-prime to, uh, to our, our characteristic two, we can choose a lift of this, which is basically you take something on the bottom and then you take the sum of all the cosets of, of, um, of that um, point. And this is well defined and forms a um, a partial inverse to what I start with. It shows that it's subjective, um, which allows you to lift this map, square composed with square, to an S4 equivariant map. And being able to do that and having the combinatorial argument is everything that you need to be able to prove the Adem relations. So. Okay, so just, just a brief diversion of why we would say that the composition of similar squares is a D8 equivariant thing, and why we should think to do the same thing for the quantum case. So if you're thinking about kind of you know, string topology type stuff, um, operads and gluing constructions and all that, uh, I'm going to here um, reference Betts' thesis and Betts and Cohen's work. Um, if you're looking at a composition of equivariant operations, this looks like a gluing construction. And you, it's like a gluing construction on the picture, but you also have to kind of glue the, um, glue the groups in the appropriate way. So here you can see um, that you've got, let's say that this bit and this bit and this bit are all quantum steel rod squares. Then this comes equipped with the group Z mod two. This comes equipped with the group Z mod two. 
this comes equipped with a group ZMOD2. And for the entire thing, what you need to take, you take the inputs here, which is ZMOD2 cross ZMOD2, and then you need to set the wreath product of ZMOD2 with ZMOD2 cross ZMOD2, which is D8. Um, so that's why D8 is the appropriate thing to, to use in this context. Um, and then, as I say, you want to use some sort of gluing construction, um, and then you glue these, these broken flow lines, shrink them to a point, and you get back this point M1, which we mentioned earlier, where one and two come together and three and four come together, which we see is a, is a fixed point under this D8 action. So in particular, it, um, uh, th this M, the, the um, operations associated to M1 will in fact be the compositions of quantum steam of squares. Right. So why, what, what, why is it interesting to look at the quantum Adam relations? Well, we can't do the same argument for the quantum Adam relations as we could for the classical Adam relations. And it really comes down to the following thing, which is that M1 in this Lemonk space is not S4 invariant, which means that we can't just sit there and lift it to an S4 equivariant operation. And so we can't just plug in the composition of, of quantum similar squares and say we do the same, we do exactly the same thing as we did for the classical case. It just doesn't work like that. Um, and in fact, you can you can show by calculating for, I think even CP2, um, maybe CP1 is too small for it, but CP2, that the quantum steamrod squares don't satisfy what you would expect them to satisfy if um, if they satisfy their dimensions. So that's a, a bit of a blow. But the thing is, even though M1 is um, is not fixed by S4, the union of M1, um, one three acting on M1 and one four acting on M1 is invariant. Because remember, one three and one four are kind of the other cosets of D8 in in Sim4. So you know uh, you can you can fill about with it a bit and see that this is invariant under S4 because these are the only objects that that kind of aren't acted on by D8. Um, so we could feasibly run the construction with with this set because we know it's invariant under S4 and therefore lifts from a D8 action to an S4 action. Um, oh, and just just a quick uh, quick point for notation. So the um, there's a, a free action of D8 on the infinite dimensional sphere cross with itself three times. Um, using just antipodal maps and kind of swapping the factors, so um, you can think uh, you can think about a cell decomposition that involves just cells parameterized by hemispheres in each of these factors. And I'm going to give, and so they're just given as say dimensions um, i, j, and k. And um, the cells that we kind of care about that represent non-trivial closed elements. There are, there are other ones, but these are the ones we care about, are the form IJJ. So that's what in the, in this quantum of relations, that's what these tuples are the same. Um, okay, so W1 is this S4 invariant set. Um, give us some conditions. You see, again, I, all I asked you to remember was that there were P's and Q's, there was a sum over S's and there was a binomial coefficient. But you can see that if you look back, that this is exactly the same formula that you had for the classical relations. And this is satisfied, but it's satisfied by now, rather than the composition of steamrod squares, which um, this is a, just a quick note that you can prove that if you the quantum steamrod composed with quantum steamrod of alpha is kind of this QD8 of the operation associated to M1 along with some um, choice of equivariant uh, parameter, um, plus the uh, operation corresponding to 1,3 acting on M1 and 1,4 acting on M1. Um, 
really early. Um, I so I guess I'd like to just stop and think about this other operation, this one three and one union one four and one. Um, now you know there there was always before doing any calculations you could always ask the question well okay you know we had this lifting process and you know proved the adem relation the quantum adem relations using s4 but perhaps this operation the one that uses just one three acting on m1 and one four acting on m1 perhaps this vanishes by some quirk of um of equivalent homology and actually we get back a nice relation using just the compositions of quantum steamroll operations. But in fact, that's, I mean, as I said before, that fails even for CP2. Um, you, know, you, you do get instances where on one side, sorry, where say here, you might only get the M1 factor surviving, and here you only get the 1,3 acting on M1 plus M1,4 acting on M1 part surviving. Um, so that's, that's a, a shame because it's very there's not really a particularly nice interpretation of the right hand side um and perhaps also you could ask well okay we've got that but maybe maybe all the non-zero ones of these can somehow be related to compositions of quantum standard operations using this you know maybe at, at most one of the operations with one three and one and one four and one is ever non-zero and so then you can kind of at least say something about, about um, a relationship between them. Um, but so here's probably the smallest example I know of a situation where, so if you're taking CP4 and you take the element of the second cohomology of CP4, then you can look at some quantum identity relations um, for X cubed and there are two terms here which are not immediately zero and i i haven't yet found a way of of forcing either one of these to be zero and so one question is you know maybe one of them is just happens to be zero and the other one is not um or maybe they're both non-zero and if they're both non-zero then there must be some information here which isn't contained just in um the compositions of quantum steel squares or maybe isn't contained in just the coincidence of quantum signal squares um yeah okay i'm afraid that's all i all i had prepared um gosh I'm fast okay thank you all right uh, thank you very much nick so uh we uh have uh, some way to applaud but uh <laughs> A bit limited. So um, I have a, a little question, uh, maybe. Uh, maybe if uh, other people have questions, please don't hesitate. So, um, uh, oh, here's one from uh, Leonid. So, Leonid, do you want to ask it? Uh, sure. So, uh, the question is uh, what is the kind of uh, favorite? Uh, your favorite application of these operations, and uh, what was the motivation for the first theorem also? I mean, uh, second, I can imagine that you generalize classical Adam relations to, to quantum settings, but first I missed what was uh, the, the, the motivation. So you, you obviously, you asked if the motivation for the, um, uh, this theorem right here. Yes, so yes. Um, so um, this was um, put forward by by Paul as potentially a way to be able to calculate um, I, I mean the, the, the whole the whole um, uh, aim of the work we were doing together was to try to calculate some some of these um, to then be able to use in in counts in some sort of neuro theoretic application um that's not really my um area of expertise was the actual um mirror symmetry calculations i think in on in his um 
paper and formal groups, he uh, discusses that a bit better. Um, and this uh, happened to be a, so actually the, the history of this is kind of interesting because originally we were attempting to, to prove a, a formula by attempting to prove a localization formula um, on the space of homomorphic curve, uh, space of homomorphic maps. And um, that was a horrendous task because we kind of, it's not, you know, things aren't smooth or smooth embedded or anything like that. So, you know, um, trying to prove anything was a nightmare. Um, and then the suggestion for this came up and um, it turns out that you get exactly the same, um, exactly the same formula that we were trying to prove just by, by proving this, which is quite nice. Um, so I'm not sure that completely answers your question. Um, in terms of my favorite applications, um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, there's, so there's some, um, sorry, there's some explicit computations coming, um, in a, in a paper under, um, that's currently being written. Um, at the top of my head, I can't remember exactly the, um, the cases that we can compute, but um, they all involve basically using this this formula and sometimes putting in some sort of um, test uh, solution and then calculating um, coefficients and things like that. Um, sometimes you can iteratively calculate them by this. I mean, there's there's um, uh, there's other what's the word other uh, maybe slightly more. Um, refined versions of, of this theorem, maybe refined isn't the right word. There's other versions of this theorem that basically use the same proof, um, but you get slightly uh, slightly further along. Um, so, so one uh, important point to make with this is that, that you know, you can use this as kind of a, a calculative tool. Um, uh, where you want to relate uh, coefficients of different um, uh, different powers of Q, let's say. Um, but the problem is, once you get to, once you're saying characteristic two, and you're looking at say um, Q squared, then you look at Q dQ of Q squared, that's gonna vanish because you get twice Q squared, which is zero. Um, so you know you you um, maybe want to refine this so that instead of using Q being a quantum variable of degree two, you use it to be um, a quantum variable of degree twice the minimal churn number. So you get a bit further um, in your calculations, but you still um, you still eventually will run into a problem where you kind of this term vanishes, but it kind of vanishes for I guess I mean I don't is it doesn't vanish because there's no, nothing interesting there. It vanishes because we're working over characteristic P. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, I have a question. Um, if uh, you, you, the classical uh, steamroad uh, operations are unstable, uh, so, is there some form of instability here? Um, um, that, that might be a bit beyond my. Um, you know, in the sense that you, when when you go high enough, they start to vanish, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, of course, here you you are in a different situation because you have coefficients in uh, in Novikov in the Novikov ring or. Uh, and uh, but still, is there some trace of instability? Maybe. Oh, so so you mean like as if if you have a high enough power of the equivariant yeah. term? Um, yeah, I mean it. Yeah, it will um, kind of because your your you sh you can think of the um, you can think of the these um, choice of um, perturbed Morse function in some interpretations you could think of it 
as follows. So rather than having a critical point X and looking at what SteamWorld does on X, you could have um, you, you could have say some element of a singular cohomology or you know a, let's say a submanifold, and you can think about this um, this choice of uh, Morse function being some sort of perturbation of this um, of this X within its its normal bundle, and um, uh, and then you look at some sort of you know, intersections with with uh, two different possible choices of um, of V, and then you would expect that there be some sort of vanishing um, once you kind of get beyond the the rank of the null bundle because kind of is there's no more um, that could be wiggled, so mm. technical term wiggled, um, perturbed is the right word. Right, I see. Okay, thank you. So I have an, another question. I'm gonna send it out. <laughs> um, so uh, there was this question about applications or possible mm -hmm. applications, and uh, one of the classical applications for uh, the usual steamroad algebra is to say that you don't have maps between certain spaces. So like for instance uh, from a finite cw complex to uh, or from a classifying space of some group in, into a finite dimensional cw complex i think is something that you might have phantom maps but you don't generally have maps so yeah. things like this so uh, is you know something of this sort uh, did you try no no, this is this isn't something that uh, I've I've got to try yet. It was, I think it's something that um, uh, maybe somebody mentioned in passing at some point during my PhD thesis, and I I remember thinking I've got no idea how to even approach that, and then forgot about it. So uh, that's probably a good good question to ask. Um, so in a way, about. it comes down to what what type of operations with symplectic manifolds. Uh, behave with respect to to this operation. So maybe if you take products, do you have like a, a formula, a QNET product, some sort of a formula for a product, or so? I, I mean, I guess it will. Yeah, uh, if you if you. I haven't written down or, or proven a formula, but I, but I would expect there to be a, a formula for the product, and it would take the the um, the form that you'd expect it to take, um, assuming that you've chosen, say, your you know, uh, the, the correct um, correct data on the side. All right. Um. So th thanks a lot. Um, so let's see if there are any other uh, questions. Um, right. So, so uh, Daniel asks about um, technical assumptions on him. Um, I so, so I mean certainly closed more terms in practical manifold is easy. Um, Weakly monotone symplectic manifold, you have to be careful with, because of multiple covered curves, but there is a way to kind of make things work where now rather than having just some fixed almost complex structure J, your almost complex structure J, because it's weakly monotone, has to be um, uh, domain dependent. And, um, and but the problem there is that if you've got a domain dependent J, you kind of um, you, you lose that symmetry, you know, you still want that symmetry. So it's also going to have to depend upon your parameter in such a way that um, your, your kind of modular spaces have a zero to action. So you can still do it for weakly monotone. Um, it's just not so nice. And then, I mean, yeah, that goes as far, I guess. Okay. So, so you, if if I can ask another question, so you know, um, 
in this paper, I, I think it's by, by Cohen and I forget who, but, but they, they construct these um, um, top, uh, topological field theory type operations. Uh, in, well, in terms of Morse theory, it's, it's one way to do it for any, for any graph and, and any uh, mm -hmm. group action on the graph. So, so do, does your story extend to, to that kind of setup? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would imagine so. Um, it's, it's really, a, I mean, it, it's a little bit dangerous in the in the direction that Leonid was, was saying because I, I don't even know of any applications for that for that kind of <laughs> machinery, even in the, yeah, in the topological case. But it's it's natural to ask. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I would imagine there's probably, I mean. Uh, probably something along those lines um i didn't dare go anywhere near that far um i mean i haven't even given you a definition of what these equivalent quantum operations are in this particular case um but yeah i probably imagine so but uh, nick in terms of applications if you know that some of your quantum uh, uh cohomology operations are non-trivial which mm -hmm. you actually you know because you do all these comp computations. I assume that you have a reinterpretation of them using uh, Hamiltonian orbits. And uh, once you have that, uh, I mean, you could replace the input instead of a critical point with a Hamiltonian mm -hmm. orbit. And once you have that, that means that you deduce from one orbit if the operation is non trivial, you deduce many more orbits, which would be the output. Uh, so, at least in principle, once you know that operations like this are non-trivial, uh, you could uh, probably, you know, you could probably sell it in some uh, way in saying, okay, I'm producing orbits where I didn't know there were so many. Okay, I would yeah, guess. Yeah. Uh, of course, you don't know if people will buy it, <laughs> but uh, you could try to sell it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying, but in principle, yeah. if you have uh, operations that are non trivial, uh, you can expect to produce more orbits than, uh, than just uh, the usual operation produce. No? Okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe Igor Shluchin can comment about this because uh, I have an impression that he has a, a work where he uses this equivalent standard squares in order to produce periodic orbits. Igor, can you say something? Yes, so, so the, 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 uh, there was a little bit of a work on um, producing obstructions on certain uh, very specific uh, uh, type of Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, Hamiltonian pseudo-rotations that uh, used actually um, um, quantum Steiner squares and uh, Nick's work. Uh, and uh, so there was some work by me and some work by Chinelli, Ginsburg, and Gurel. Uh, and yeah, so I, I think the, the outcome so far is basically that um, if there is a pseudo rotation, then the quantum Steiner square, the point class, must be deformed. So in particular, the manifold is uniruled by holomorphic curves. And th there was a, 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 another uh, development related to uh, hofer zender conjecture that actually produces infinitely many periodic points that uses a, a version of the quantum Steinerod operation uh, called uh, equivariant pair of fence product, or uh, it's, maybe it's variant for higher primes p, uh, but there is um, no actual relation to the quantum Steinrod operation used in that second. Uh, uh, I but in any case, that, that shows that the principle uh, is valid in the sense that mm -hmm. uh, non-vanishing of this operation should produce uh, orbits and and calculations you do with them, probably some at least of them should be possible to re reinterpret in these terms. At least my, my guess. 
Yes, well, <laughs> yes. For certain kind of operations, just the standard, standard squares and standard powers, uh, your position has been checked. <laughs> and you it too. Right, so I mean, you know, that was a basic principle in classical topology that you have this, this, uh, this uh, algebra of operations, and when when it's non-trivial, you get obstructions or the existence of certain particular phenomena. That, in any case, uh, so uh, thank you very much again, Nick. Uh, it's. Um, uh, let me see if there are any other questions. Uh, Danny, do you see any? Ah, uh, Vukashin, sorry, uh, question. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you can ask the question. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I, I, I didn't get it from the discussion. So is it completely worked out, uh, like the definition on the chain level in Hamiltonian for homology of this? Operations or not? Because Igor mentioned something about the equivalent pair of pens product, but is it like like the whole theory is translated or just parts or what? What's the state with this? Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, sorry, I was. It's unclear what you mean by uh, uh, worked out completely, but for quantum standard powers, the answer is yes. But for these other operations that Nick uh, mentions, uh, I'm not sure, and probably some of them don't even extend. Right, Nick? Yeah, I, I would imagine that, uh, um, that, that some of them have certain problems um, I, I recall an issue with, well, yeah, an issue with trying to prove a version of the, uh, sim the Cartan relation, which is to do with products, um, the product of the, the cut product commutes with the classical steamrod square and in the quantum case, it, there's a it commutes, but there's up to another another um, additional term. But then when you try to do the same thing in Hamiltonian Fleur theory, you kind of come across the problem that well, there's not really a, a nice product on the equivariant symplectic or Fleur cohomology. So it doesn't really really mean much to to say um, that you know the the version of the pair of pants kind of commutes with this product because it doesn't work in the same sort of way. It's too too kind of rigid because you you haven't got this rotational, you know, um, right? Yeah. Okay. But cool. That, that was very clear. Right. Maybe in some cases you have like uh, these operations acting on Hamiltonian floor homology. Was yeah, not not really being an operation on Hamiltonian floor homology, but acting on it in a way. Mm. You know, this, this corresponds to having one input Hamiltonian uh, uh, periodic orbit and maybe just one output being a Hamiltonian orbit. And then, of course, you have to worry about the symmetry, but uh, maybe some of them could work like that. Um, in any case, um, any more comments or uh, questions? Thank you. Or remarks. One comment, actually, actually uh, about action, I think uh, Nick, Nick has a paper that, uh, uh, in fact, works out some sort of action of this kind. Ah. Well, very good. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see any more things, uh, you know, basically, uh, if you want to say something more, that's a moment for it. <laughs> um, and if not, um, thank you very much again, uh, Nick, for the talk. And uh, thanks again. So uh, 
Uh, I'm going to give you a little applause on my board here again. 